Okay, so a uh, new section, uh, derivative transformations. Um, we've spent a bunch of time talking about directional derivatives. And reminder, um, there, oh, I wanted to switch colors. Uh, reminder, here it is. There's our definition of a directional derivative, and there's something pretty impressive about this uh, about this formula. What this says is wherever you may happen to be, whatever this point A is in the domain, and furthermore, whichever direction you might want to be going and however fast you might be going in that direction, we have a constructive definition for exactly uh, what is the uh, re corresponding rate of change of the output. So you give me an input velocity, I give you an output velocity. In some sense, we have computed, I'm going to say, loosely speaking, all possible derivatives of this function f at that point. So you'd think that we're done. Uh, but uh, there is actually uh, quite a bit more to say about derivatives. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> there's, uh, I'm not going to be able to say all of it. Uh, we just don't have time. Um, this section has a lot of really, f uh, to me, very fascinating stuff in it, but it's uh, it's a little borderline, perhaps a little bit more than is, uh, uh, you know, in, given the time constraints that we have, you know, a good choice for Math 212. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff. Uh, but I'm going to hit... Eh, what I think are the important highlights, certainly all the stuff that we're actually going to need. Um, I do want to start with an example um, of uh, something that's an eyebrow raiser, I hope, for y'all. Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, here's a uh, polynomial function, perfectly reasonable function, two input variables, x1 and x2. And uh, suppose I tie down a point A in the domain. And uh, let's compute a directional derivative. But, I, but here's the twist. I want to compute this directional derivative, even though I have not told you the velocity. I want to do it in terms of the velocity vector. So I want. I don't want the a single directional derivative. I want a formula for directional derivatives of this function at that point in terms of the velocity vector. A, I want a general formula. And so now there's nothing uh, different about the calculation, particularly. You still parameterize the line A plus TV. It's just that now there's a couple of variables left in there, V1 and V2. It's still just A plus TV. Um, you still plug that into your function P. You still get some great big thing. Right? Which you still then take the derivative of and plug in t equals zero. It's just that when you go through, and by the way, I'm gonna, you guys can do algebra, right? But you take that great big thing, multiply it out, take the derivative, uh, uh, plug in t equals zero. Um, what you end up with is, uh, as we hoped, a formula. This is a formula for how to compute directional derivatives of that polynomial function, uh, at the point A. General formula. No matter what your velocity vector is, this little formula computes your directional derivative for you. And that's kind of <coughs> handy, I suppose. Now, the point of view you can take on this is all right, so you, you so we did a little parallel processing on our calculation here. Yeah, so what? Is this a, is this a new concept? Not really. Uh, what then is the merit of this example? Uh, the merit is the following eyebrow raiser. Notice that what we have here, this, this formula, directional derivative as a function of velocity, is a linear transformation. How about that? What are the odds? Will this always happen? Was this a lucky, was there something magical about this function that the derivative had to be a linear transformation? This is a trick. Um, and uh, it turns out, this is not a trick, it turns out that uh, not only is this true for all polynomials, this is not a magic polynomial, all polynomials do this. Calculation's not terribly different from what you're looking at right here. Um, all functions that are kind of like polynomials also have this feature. And uh, now let me, uh, I want to flash you very briefly back to uh, Calc 2. Y'all remember Taylor series? Mo oh, some of the people don't. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So Taylor series is a way of approximating functions, and it's a really good way of approximating functions, and it does a uh, a really good job, almost a perfect job in the vast majority of cases. Most functions 
there are some exceptions, and I don't want to be precise about this. But uh, most functions, as far as we're concerned, um, are effectively perfectly approximated by their Taylor series. And Taylor series are just, a, it's a bunch of polynomials. Right? So roughly speaking then, the vast majority of functions that we're ever going to deal with are yeah, pretty much, uh, you know, other than, you know, epsilon, little micro uh, con series convergence, um, pretty much polynomials. So what we're seeing here is actually a model for how you compute directional derivatives of most functions. Most functions, directional derivatives are a linear transformation on the velocity vector. And that is not something that we knew previously. The mere fact that we have a formula for directional derivatives, constructive formula, uh, really blindly misses this structure. There's an underlying structure to how those end up working out. And just having the formula for it does not reveal it. So uh, anyway, that's a kind of a big deal. I want to come back to that in a moment. Um, now, there is uh, a, a, another little thing I have to say. Um, <clears throat> Y'all remember in Calc 1, you define differentiability. And the definition of differentiability is kind of exactly what you would think it is. A function is differentiable if you can differentiate it. Right? Hardly worth saying. <laughs> right? And in other words, if the derivative is well defined, then uh, the function is differentiable. No big. Um, that is not true in multivariable calculus. It's not that simple. Differentiability is a weird thing. And this is another thing I'm going to mostly have to skip. Uh, I want to I want to uh, nod and doff the cap to the definition of differentiability. Uh, I want you to see that this is ooh, this is different. This is uh, this is not just oh yeah I need to be able to compute derivatives in some form or fashion. This is a, a non-trivial thing. There are great reasons for this to be the definition of differentiability, but it's a long discussion that we don't have uh, time for in this course. So uh, I want you to be aware that uh, differentiability is hard to define exactly, but it's also really important um, for uh, 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 various reasons, and uh, this is uh, the, the pitch that I'm going to give you on that. It just turns out that differentiability, again, this very hard to define thing in the multivariable context, that is the precise condition on a bunch of different theorems. There's a lot of things that we want to do in multivariable calculus where differentiability is essential. If the function is not differentiable, the theorem doesn't work. Right? Um, and that it's exactly, precisely the, the, uh, the, uh, the sharp condition. So anyway, um, it's awkward. I mean, I have to mention it because of this, but Motivating the definition, working with the definition is, is hard. So anyway, uh, FYI. Um, now, um, here is a, um, then a, a definition of a related thing. If a function is differentiable, um, uh, well, I, you know what? I skipped this theorem. Um, well, let me just come down to the, the punchline. Um, if a function is differentiable, then all of the directional derivatives, just like the polynomials we just looked at, all of the directional derivatives can be computed with a linear transformation. And that's what this is saying here. Um, all the directional derivatives can be computed by a certain linear transformation acting on the velocity vector. So uh, in different notation, this is what we were looking at with that previous polynomial. We were surprised to see that directional derivatives were computed with a linear transformation. Here we go. All the directional derivatives. There's a linear transformation called d sub f comma a. That, when you apply it to the velocity vector v, gives you that velocity vector's directional derivatives. Okay. Now, this equation is uh, <clears throat> a little bit of a weird equation. Uh, a lot of students look at this equation and say, well, that, look, there's the same four letters. Uh, <laughs> and these four letters have just been kind of jumbled. I mean, 
if I've got a capital D and an F and an A and a V, uh, I mean, what's the difference? <laughs> right. So I do want to emphasize these are different things. What we have over here on the right side of the equation is an old concept. Oh, I um, can't zoom in that tight. This is an old concept. Um, got some function, and uh, I'm going to focus my attention on a certain thin aspect of F, namely what's happening at the point A, and as I move in straight lines out of the point A in the direction of V, and that's all that I require of F. I'm not interested in what F is doing as I go in other directions. This, this is a very myopic tunnel vision. Look, I'm here, I'm going that way, I don't care what's going on over there, and I don't care what's going on up there, and I don't even really care what's going on way over there, I just care about what, okay, just right here, I'm going back just a little bit that way, a little bit back that, this is all I care about. Directional derivatives are, like I say, uh, tunnel vision, um, uh, little calculation. Okay. Whereas, that is not what's going on on this side of the equation. On this side of the equation, we're saying, listen, we're interested in the function f at the point A, sure. But I require, in order to be able to talk about this linear transformation, I require that something really nice, something really natural um, be, be uh, satisfied by this function f. I need to know from this point A that in all directions there's a certain regularity, a certain simplicity. Things have to be going in such a natural, simple way that I can claim that there is a single linear transformation. Just one. You know, for the given function f at this point a, that there is this one function that by itself can compute all of these directional derivatives, no matter what velocity vector you take. So, for the left side of the equation to even make sense, F has to satisfy a lot of requirements. This is a, this is a delicate left-hand side of the equation. The right-hand side of the equation, and eh, not so much. F is really only responsible for what's going on in a single direction, and you compute this one direction at a time. Who cares? Okay. So, anyway, I wanted to be clear that these, this is a non-trivial statement, right? Um, now, the following is true. If the left side of the equation exists, if, if the function is differentiable, therefore if there is this derivative transformation, then the right side of the equation is always fine, no problem. You can always compute those directional derivatives the old-fashioned way if you should so choose. It uh, does not go the other way around. If you can compute all the directional derivatives in every possible direction, no matter which direction, all directional derivatives exist, it does not follow that the function is differentiable. It does not follow, even more so, does not follow that uh, those directional derivatives can be computed with the linear transformation. They might be all wacky, but completely unrelated, non-linear. Right? So the left side, much more delicate. Keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, moving along, um, we already know certain facts about directional derivatives. And now let me just rewrite those facts about directional derivatives uh, for differentiable functions and in the language of the derivative transformation. Right? I mean, what we have here, this is just the right-hand sides. I've just rewritten um, uh, directional derivatives as derivative transformations. This derivative transformation, when you apply it to an input change of either type, gives you the corresponding output change. That's really the same statements that we made about directional derivatives. So again, there's a kind of a yes, yeah, so what um, uh, sort of reaction to this observation. And here's what's nice about this. Here's what's really interesting about this. One of the complaints we made about uh, the um, about directional derivatives was that it wasn't there wasn't like a a single thing that you do to inputs to get outputs. It was like rather there is this process. Well, if you give me a v, I can take that v and I can go through this whole little song and dance with parameterizing lines and 
you know, uh, looking at output curves and taking derivatives and plugging in t equals. I can go through this whole process to get an output change. So directional derivatives are kind of a relationship. It's a there's a connection between input changes and output changes. Here we have a simple standalone independent thing that exists by itself. This is exactly the thing that you do to input changes to get output changes. So that is the derivative. Uh, now we've seen a bunch of different kinds of derivatives. We're going to see at least one more in uh, later this lecture. Uh, so I, I can move along. Uh, this is really the most fundamental, in my opinion. This is the most fundamental kind of derivative uh, because it applies universally. Any function, any you know, any Euclidean function, you know, real numbers in, real numbers out, you know, vectors in, vectors out. This thing by itself, that linear transformation, is the connection between input changes and output changes. Um, okay. Now, conspicuously lacking at this moment is uh, how do you compute that? And we'll get to that uh, soonish. It'll be in the next section, uh, but uh, we're, this this section we're going to wrap up pretty quickly. Um, okay. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, now let's uh, revisit that previous example um, that we looked at the polynomial function in the um, first example from today. First example from this section, and we found uh, this formula for computing those directional derivatives, right? And and our eyebrow raiser was, hey, weird, look at this. Um, how about that? That's a linear transformation on V. Isn't that weird? Um, what we now have is um, keeping in mind that directional derivatives for di differentiable functions, directional derivatives are computed by a linear transformation. We can see exactly what that linear transformation is. This linear transformation applies to a vector V and is computed by that formula. Or said differently, that linear transformation, the matrix shorthand for that linear transformation is this little matrix that has one row, <laughs> two elements, one row, uh, the matrix is two, five. So we have found that this is the derivative transformation of this function um, <clears throat> at that point. And here's another way to uh, say that. Again, think back to think back to Calc one, right? If someone uh, gives you a um, if someone gives you a single variable function and says you compute the derivative at the following point, what's your answer? It's a number, right? Sure. Oh, now if they say compute the derivative of the function and they don't give you a point, then yeah, they want a function. But what that derivative function is is something that you can plug in at a point. You get a number. So fundamentally, a single variable derivative is a number. Um, for a multivariable function, fundamentally, the derivative is an array of numbers, you might say, right? Where this array of numbers is the matrix shorthand representing the derivative of that in the linear transformation. Okay. All right. Um, for uh, for most functions, you can go through this pretty much this process. Uh, you can take. Um, oh, here it is. Take the function and you know pick the point for which you want to compute the derivative. Uh, write down the general formula for the directional derivative. Make sure to leave your velocity vector unspecified, right? And uh, just go compute the directional derivative, and you will end up with what is uh, by inspection a linear transformation, and from that you can infer the corresponding matrix. Um, you can do that. Good news. Most of the time, we're not going to. There's a better way. But we haven't discovered that yet. We'll discover that soon. Okay. Okay. Um, so here's a sticky point. Um, all of this stuff was contingent on the function being differentiable. 
and differentiability has a weird definition. I vaguely referred to it. I, I waved my hands at it, right? Um, well, if all this only works if the function's differentiable, and if we don't know how to work with the definition of differentiability, it, can we actually do this, or what's, I mean, how do you check if a function's differentiable, and therefore how do you know if any of this actually works? Um, and that is a nasty problem. Um, here's, uh, here's the good news. There is a related idea called continuous differentiability. And I, I know y'all remember this from Calc 1. Uh, there is a, y'all remember what it means for a function to be differentiable? Um, there is uh, this related idea for a function to be continuously differentiable. You need for it to be differentiable. And the derivative has to be continuous. It's a pretty easy definition in Calc 1. Um, and despite the fact that differentiability is much weirder in multivariable context, continuous differentiability is not. Continuous differentiability is super simple to define. A uh, function is continuously differentiable if, uh, if the partial derivatives exist and are continuous. <laughs> it's exactly, I mean, uh, you know, the fingers crossed. If you had no idea how to define continuous, what does it mean for a function to be continuously differentiable? This would be what you'd be hoping for, right? This would have been your guess that the partial derivatives, world's easiest derivatives to compute. Uh, how about we just, I'll, I'll compute those and, oh, it says continuous. Okay, well, let's make sure that they're continuous then. And it's right. That is the definition. Very easy to work with. Um, the reason we care about this is because every continuously differentiable function is differentiable. And remember, differentiability is what we really care about. So in practice, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be rare that you're going to find yourself, okay, I'd like to use this theorem. There's a certain theorem. Uh, in order to use my theorem, I need to know the function is differentiable. Ugh, the definition of differentiability is hard. How am I going to deal with, how am I going to show this function differentiable? Most of the time, what you're going to do is you're going to say, well, how about I'll just prove it's continuously differentiable, and then I will observe that because it's continuously differentiable, therefore it is differentiable, and therefore I can use whatever theorem it is that I want to use. Continuous differentiability is a is a wonderfully convenient little sidestep of uh, of difficulty. Um, so uh, here's a nice example uh, of this. Uh, here is a uh, function from R two to R two, and the, the question comes up: Is this function differentiable? Oh yikes! Do we have to go back and look at that ugly definition that involved the multivariable limit and this great big fraction and magnitudes and ugh. Um, nope. This function has some partial derivatives that are easy to compute. Quick observations, right? There's all the partial derivatives, first partials of all the components of that function f. These are obviously continuous, right? They're, they're um, products of compositions of uh, known established continuous functions uh, as we cite the the theorem back in the, back in the section on limits um, so this function is therefore continuously differentiable and therefore is differentiable it's that easy everybody on board okay um, okay so there's there's a bunch of more things to say, and I, it makes me a little sad to not talk about these things. I, this is really interesting stuff. Here's a wacky uh, surface, by the way. Um, you can't do this with a piece of paper. <laughs> paper doesn't bend like this. But this is, a, uh, this is a graph of a really weird function that has this really strange property. Uh, if you're looking at the origin, at the origin, and I can draw a better picture. If anyone wants to ask me an office hour, I can show you a better picture of this. Um, this function, no matter what direction you go from the origin, all the directional derivatives exist. The directional derivatives are all fine. No prop, not even resembling a problem. In fact, all the directional derivatives are kind of easy to compute. 
but they don't have that linearity to them. This function is not differentiable. Even though all the partial derivatives exist, all the directional derivatives exist, if you took a you know uh, early early chapter four point of view on this function, you'd say, I don't see anything wrong with what's going on with this function. No matter where I look from the origin, everything looks just perfectly straight and, and fine. Uh, but there is a nasty problem. You can even see from the picture that this thing's all kind of, there's a weird kind of a anomaly corner or something. Something very strange is happening at that point. Right? Uh, and that's uh, ultimately related to the fact that this is not a differential. And directional derivatives do not detect that at all. Okay. All right. I wish we had more time to talk about this kind of stuff. Okay, moving along, talk about um, this directional, uh, excuse me, this uh, derivative transformation is, uh, again. So if we have a uh, derivative transformation, a, a differentiable function, now keep in mind, uh, it's only for a differentiable function that you can talk about the derivative transformation. The derivative transformation is the linear transformation that computes all of the directional derivatives. Uh, <clears throat> but we need the function to be differentiable to be able to do that. Um, that said, it's a linear transformation, and when you have a linear transformation, we like to represent linear transformations with a matrix because it's really convenient and compact. And so let's talk about this matrix. Well, so that matrix is called uh, the Jacobian matrix. Uh, we use the notation J to represent the Jacobian matrix. All that is, again, is just the matrix representing the derivative transformation. Um, <clears throat> it is common and pretty acceptable to refer to the Jacobian as the derivative uh, of the function. Because, you know, again, what is it? The Jacobian, it, it's a matrix representing the derivative transformation. The derivative transformation really is the derivative. Um, so, you know, let's be, be, let's be aware that these are technically different things. This is a linear transformation. This is a shorthand for representing the linear transformation. But, uh, you know, they do the same thing. The whole point of the shorthand is that it should do precisely and exactly what the linear transformation says it should do. All right. Nice thing about Jacobian matrices, again, it's a matrix. We have matrix operations. Uh, we uh, 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 can compute the elements of it. It's a convenient notation. A lot of nice things about matrices. Okay. So let's talk about how to compute it. How do we compute this matrix that magically computes all of my directional derivatives for me? This is a wonderful calculation. It's one of my favorite calculations in the course. Um, start off by observing Think back to chapter three when we're talking about linear transformations and matrices representing them. One of the fundamental relationships between matrices and linear transformations, the columns are the images of the standard basis vectors. That was really, that was our definition of a matrix. So if I want to know what is the jth column, let's say, the jth column of this Jacobian matrix, I need to apply the corresponding linear transformation, D, to the jth standard basis vector. And everything else that follows is just, um, you know, uh, oh, old established facts. Uh, so first, notice, what does the, the linear transformation, D, do to a vector? Well, it computes a directional derivative. That's, uh, that's the basic property of the derivative transformation. What is this directional derivative? Well, this is no random directional derivative. This is a unit directional derivative. Even better, this is a partial derivative because it's a di unit directional derivative where the vector is a standard basis vector. So that's just a partial derivative. And good news about partial derivatives, partial derivatives, this partial of f with respect to a given uh, input variable, partial derivatives are computed component-wise. So I can compute the partial of f by individually computing 
the partial derivatives of all of the individual components of f. So let me uh, quick summary what we have here then. Uh, we've just shown that if I want to understand the most sophisticated point of view on derivatives that we have in this course, the most sophisticated point of view is oh, uh, derivatives are a linear transformation. Uh, you know, this function's going to be different. Uh, a linear transformation that uh, you know uh, magically computes all directional derivatives all at once automatically for us. That most sophisticated thing is computed by um, the world's easiest to crank out type of derivative, namely partial derivatives. And yeah, you got to do a whole matrix of them, right? But each one of these is everyone's favorite kind of derivative, partial derivatives. You get to use all your old friends, all your old rules, chain rule, uh, product rule, quotient rule, all that single variable calculus derivative rules business. And you get to, for the as you go through each one of these derivatives, being as it is a partial derivative, you get to pretend like a lot of your function is constant, which makes life much better. So it's a wonderful result that the uh, formula works out this nicely. Okay, so make sure to remember this formula. Uh, again, this is called uh, the Jacobian matrix for a differentiable function. Uh, one thing to be careful about, um, it's really easy to transpose this matrix, right? So notice in the first column, it's always partials with respect to the first input variable. In the first row, it's always partials of the first output variable. And it's super common for students to inadvertently just, you know, whoops, just, just you know, flip it, right, get those backwards, and then you have written something down that doesn't make any sense and it's not a Jacobian matrix. It does matter. Transposing the matrix, not not the same. Okay, so we've got to be, be careful with that. Um, the, the way I remember that personally, and I encourage you to aim for a similar sort of point of view, is think about this calculation, right? We calculate the columns one at a time. Columns correspond to um, directional derivatives, which correspond to input variables. So each column... Again, you just think through how we computed it. Each column corresponds to a specific input variable. Hope that makes sense. Everybody happy? Okay. All right. Okay. All righty. Um, so um, do do be careful. Um, very important. It is critical <laughs> that you make sure um, that the function is actually differentiable right now let's look back at this formula uh, a, a lot of students in a lot of situations will say oh well sweet all I've got, if I want a Jacobian matrix all I got to do is take whatever function someone gives me someone gives me a function cool well, I'm going to start computing partial derivatives of it and if I can compute all those partial derivatives then I've got me a Jacobian matrix and I'm going to start using the Jacobian matrix to compute the derivative transformation and stuff like that. And that's not okay. That's not, it doesn't work. It's, it's false. Um, because if you are simply just computing the Jacobian matrix because it's made up of a bunch of partials and if you declare victory on successful computation of this formula, note all you've checked is that the function that, that, that all the partial derivatives exist. You have not checked that all the partial derivatives are continuous. It's only if the partial derivatives are continuous that you know the function is continuously differentiable and therefore differentiable. And therefore that this means anything at all. Right? So if you were to apply the, 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 the naive strategy of ah, I'm just going to compute a Jacobian and go about my business. Okay? If you were to apply that strategy to this function, you would compute some dramatically wrong answers. Drama I mean, really just way off. Not even close. Right? So don't make that mistake. Uh, good news. 
This is easy to resolve. All you have to do, if you want to know the function's differentiable, just show that it's continuously differentiable and it immediately follows that the function is differentiable and therefore your Jacobian matrix actually is a Jacobian matrix. The functions, you can do, go about your business and compute with the derivative transformation just like you wish you could. So don't forget to uh, take this step right here. Don't forget to show continuous differentiability, conclude differentiability um, before going on. Uh, let me take a pause. I, I uh, should give you all an opportunity to get a word in edgewise if you'd like. Anybody? Is everybody? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of back in the other section. Yep. But if we're doing partials to see if it's continuous, do we have to do partials for x and y? Um, yeah, so uh, let, me, let me get back to where that was here. Yeah, so if you want to, here, for this example, if you want to show that this function is differentiable and if you want to cite uh, continuous differentiability to do it, which I think is what you're asking, is that right? Yeah, so you have to, yeah, you, so you have to take the partial derivatives of both components of the function, f1 and f2, uh, with respect to x, but you also have to take the partials of both the components of the function f1 and f2 also with respect to y. Yeah. So you've got to take the partials of all of the output variables with respect to all of the input variables. All, 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 sadly. Yeah. Does that make sense? Cool. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's like the uh, I'm sorry. Let me let me get back to uh, to our formula here. What was the, what was your question? Uh, the, the taking the, the uh, inputs of the Jacobian matrix with respect to the partial derivative. Um, I, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure I understand your question, but uh, so let me let me point out that when you when uh, so what we have here is a function f. Um, from uh, R in into R you know, did I say um, M okay so this is uh, R M so um, this M is because F has M different outputs right but uh, analogously this N is because there are N Different inputs, and so yeah, you've got to take the you've got to take the derivatives, all the all the you've got to assemble all the partial derivatives of all the output variables with respect to all of the input variables. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. Is that okay? So if you're supposed to uh, count, to find that the, the function is continuously differentiable, yeah. Like we we'll, we'll still have to take the partial derivatives. Yeah, yeah. So one th one thing you can do is, you, I mean, the the partial derivatives that that need to be continuous in order to cite differentiability are exactly the same as the partial derivatives that you use to assemble the Jacobian matrix in the first place. So one thing you could do is say, um, uh, let's hope that this Jacobian matrix means something, and then you write this down, and then you say, uh, direct observation, all of these. Partial derivatives are continuous, and therefore this is a Jacobian matrix, and therefore we're good. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's uh, let's compute one. Um, so uh, here's a multivariable function, and inside of our domain, notice this is a function from R2 to R3. Uh, suppose we're sitting at that point and moving with this velocity. Uh, let's compute the velocity of the output. Okay, now, if, if this were several sections back, then we would say, uh, oh, okay, we've been given, you know, a function at a point. Uh, we've been given an input velocity. And we want to know the output velocity. Hey, this is asking us to compute a directional derivative. And then, and then we would, we would have to, we have to parameterize our straight line a plus t v. We have to plug that into this formula. It's a little annoying because there's cubes and squares and trigs and three separate elements. And, you know. Um, 
it would be a little bit tedious, but we could punch that up. So what we're going to do now instead is say, oh, well, we've been asked for a directional derivative and um, this function is continuously differentiable. I know it is because when I take the partials of this with respect to these, all of those partial derivatives are clearly continuous. It's just going to be trig and monomials. And I guess it'll be a, it'll be a, a polynomial because there's two terms there. But let's see. Is it no, 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 um, no? This is just trig and monomials, and all of those are known to be continuous. Um, and so, because it's continuously differentiable, it is therefore differentiable, and therefore I can use the Jacobian matrix. And uh, said differently, I can compute all of my directional derivatives instead by using the derivative transformation, aka the Jacobian matrix. And the Jacobian matrix is just partial derivatives. Again, super easy to compute uh, partial derivatives. You know, there's six of them to compute, but again, Matter of writing down and having written down those uh, partial derivatives, uh, don't forget to plug in your point. Right, we've got this base point uh, pi comma pi over two that we have to plug in. That turns those formulas into those values, and our calculation then boils down to multiplying this Jacobian matrix times this velocity vector that's just been sitting over here waiting for its turn. And uh, multiplying those out, we get that the directional derivative, that product, is that. And uh, if you would like, you are welcome to, you know, for a sort of a A B kind of, you know, which one do you like better? Uh, you could work out this directional derivative the old-fashioned way, right? And see which one you like better. Um, prediction: I think you're going to like this better. <laughs> right, it's a lot less tedious than uh, we know going through uh, the whole uh, the whole ca otherwise calculation. Okay, how are we doing? Questions? Everybody's happy. Okay. All right. Uh, another example. Now, this is just a revisit. Uh, Y'all may recall that we did look at this exact function uh, and computed directional derivatives uh, back in uh, section four point three parameterized the line and stuck it in and expanded and took the derivative and plugged it in, blah, blah, blah. And so just uh, let me just to, to show you a direct comparison, you know, what does that look like from a Jacobian point of view? Well, first of all, that function's clearly continuously differentiable because all the partials are easy. I mean, they're all clearly continuous. Continuously differentiable means differentiable, means Jacobian matrix works. The Jacobian is super convenient to write down. No problem. Um, you plug in this base point, the point A, and uh, you get this super convenient little matrix. And then I uh, made quick matrix multiplication and we're done. So now again, compare, you know, suit yourself. Uh, see which one you like better. Look back into section 4.3, see where we did this the old fashioned way the brute force way, and compare with this Jacobian calculation. This is easier. Everybody on board? Okay. Um, do be careful to make sure that you take your partial derivatives the right way. Again, it's so easy to mess this up. Um, remember, the big rule is input variables correspond to columns. Right? So... This first column down here, we're taking partials with respect to x. Partials with respect to x give it, well, y, zero. Okay. Um, second input variable, partials give me the second column. Uh, third input variable, partials give me the third column. Input variables correspond to columns. Okay, everybody's happy. We'll move along. Uh, several more examples, uh, and I encourage you to read these, but uh, they're equivalent to things we've just talked through. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so here's a little bit of a twist on, on that idea. Um, let's consider uh, a special case, and that is of functions that are real valued. So uh, a real valued function, that's a little bit of terminology. Real valued means that the output values are just real numbers. So real valued is, is, a, is, is sort of lingo for the target is R1. All right. Well, now, okay. If that's the case, keep in mind that uh, you know, for each input variable, for each of you know several input variables over here, uh, we get a corresponding column, uh, and in each one of those columns, what we're taking is uh, we're taking the derivatives of all of the output variables. But if there's only one output variable, then we only get one entry in each of those n columns. Said differently, <laughs> if you have a real valued function, your Jacobian matrix is just a single row matrix. And it turns out that something kind of neat happens as a consequence of this. Uh, let's write that write down. You know, so how do I compute directional derivatives? Here's my formula for directional derivatives. We compute directional derivatives with the derivative transformation, assuming it's differentiable. We compute the derivative transformation with the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix, we just agreed, consists of a single row, right? And multiplying a single row matrix times a single vector, which we can think of as a column, well, a uh, single row, single column, uh, this is a dot product. I mean, why morally? I mean, in other words, if you um, take this, I mean, you, the arithmetic of it is this times that plus this times that plus this times that. It's, it's a morally it's a dot product, right? Or if you want to, you know, uh, worry about the details, if you take this row matrix and just turn it on its side, then it is literally a dot product. Okay. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, so here we go. There it is, written as a dot product. I can compute directional derivatives with that dot product. And um, here's the thing, I understand dot products. Right? We have geometric interpretations of the dot product in ways that we don't have analogous geometric interpretations exactly. We have different knowledge of what linear transformations do, right? But um, there's some specific geometric connections that we have with dot products. So the opportunity that comes up, you know, why this why this is going to lead to something useful, you know, who cares with the real value output, you get a single row, whatever, who cares? The reason we care is because, because we can write this as a dot product, I'm going to be able to interpret directional derivatives in the context of dot products in a way that helps me make geometric sense out of this vector. So this thing here, uh, and it's, you know, it's just, it's the Jacobian matrix turned sideways. Right? This thing is going to have geometric significance because of the geometric significance of the dot product. So let me take a pause on that uh, just to make sure everybody is okay. Let's absorb... Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, by the way, uh, this this thing here, uh, it is going to have geometric significance. We are going to be, uh, therefore, capitalizing on that geometric <laughs> significance. Oh, that scared me. <laughs> Jack, come here, buddy. <laughs> no, don't don't eat the bug, buddy. Okay, stay here. Okay, stay. Yeah, that scared me. I thought the the uh, desk was just had become alive. <laughs> yeah, what do we got there? Oh, that's a pretty big spider. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, he'll go somewhere. <laughs> um. Okay. So this thing is something that is geometrically significant. Uh, we're going to be using that. 
And when you're using something, it's nice to give it a name. Don't worry about it, Jack. It's okay. It's okay, buddy. Um, so we're going to give that thing a name. It is called the gradient vector. Uh, and uh, there it is again. Uh, here's the notation that we use right there. It is a, uh, an upside down triangle. Uh, like so, and uh, that just this just reads gradient of f at the point a. Again, all it is is a vector consisting of all the partial derivatives. It's I said differently. It's the Jacobian matrix turned sideways. Okay. Here, um, you know, keep in mind with Jacobian matrices, there's a. Um, uh, let's see, where did he go? By the way, yeah, he's probably under the table or something. Um, uh, for Jacobian matrices, input variables correspond to columns. Um, here, there's only one output variable, but everything's been turned on its side. So here, input variables do not correspond to columns. There is only one column, and the column uh, is uh, the partials of just that one output variable. So anyway, keep in mind we turned it on its side until the rules changed. Okay. All right. Oh, here, buddy. Come here. Okay. All right. Okay. Why don't you take a little sip? Okay. There you go, buddy. Okay. I think the spiders got him a little, <laughs> a little worried. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So um, here's the uh, first observation. Now, this is something we just got through stating, right? But. Um, how do we compute directional derivatives? Well, we compute directional for differentiable functions. Notice this, this is differentiable by assumption. You have a differentiable function. The way we compute directional derivatives is with the derivative transformation, which is in practice done with the Jacobian matrix. But our little twist on it now is that that Jacobian matrix turned sideways is a, then a dot product with the gradient vector. So. This isn't actually a new formula exactly. This is just a twist on the old formula. Okay. 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 Okay, calm down. Calm down. Um, right. Okay. Um, and another quick observation. So uh, remember, here's our Jacobian matrix, and um, we made the observation that columns yeah, come here. Uh, that columns correspond to uh, input variables, right? So you can see here, this first column is all the partials with respect to x1. So, uh, you know, casually speaking, you might refer to this as the x1 column of the Jacobian matrix. Okay. Um, well, now that we have gradients defined, let me observe that that first row of the Jacobian. Well, there's partials with respect to a bunch of different variables. We have partials with respect to x1, x2, blah, 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 all the way through xn. But notice, these are all of the various partials of f1. So the rows correspond to output variables. Another way of saying that is that the rows of the Jacobian individually are um, gradients. Right, so the first row of the Jacobian matrix is you know, turned back around the original way, of course. Um, rows are gradients of the individual component functions. Sorry, just an observation. Okay, all right, buddy. So I'm going to assume that the spider has uh, made a happy home underneath this thing. He has not emerged out from under there that I see. But if you want to keep an eye on, <laughs> take a little glance down there every now and then to see, make sure he's not uh, going to come get you. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right, here's the first thing I want to talk about about the gradient vector. Um, let's look at a uh, let's look at a real valued function. 
uh, with a uh, uh, domain over here, and let's consider a, uh, a point here in the domain, this point A. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, real value function, that means that there's a gradient vector, and so I've drawn, as you can see here, uh, the gradient of this function f at that point A. There it is. Just as uh, just to have it on the picture. Now, here's the question I want to ask, though. Reasonable question. Um, and by the way, pretty practical question in a lot of circumstances. Let's suppose this function f represents something you're interested in. You know, you have immediate interest of. Think, for example, mosquito concentration in that that uh, example from a ways back. I have immediate interest. I would like to know right now. Um, how do I understand a mosquito concentration near where I am? And I could very reasonably want to know, look, uh, I've got a bunch of different directions to choose from here uh, in which I could run as fast as I possibly can to get away from mosquitoes. Right? Of all my different unit vectors representing directions that I could run, which direction should I run? If I want to make this function increase as fast as possible, or depending on your situation, decrease as fast as possible, right? Now that's a very practical question to ask. What direction makes the most immediate difference as I start moving in that direction um, at a given speed? Okay. So um, <clears throat> we're going to consider all these possible unit vectors here. bunch of different unit vectors, and I want to know which one's the best one. Now, let's, let me emphasize, I'm considering only unit vectors, because I only want to distinguish the directions, right? Uh, there's a temptation to say, hey, you know, if you want to get rid of the, you want to get away from the mosquitoes as fast as possible, run faster. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, for sure, right? But let's just go ahead and assume that I'm running as fast as I possibly can, right? So, that, so I don't want to talk about the the speed because that's a given. I want to I want to constrain my consideration to just the direction. Okay. All right. Well, here's how this works. Um, we want to compute. Um, <clears throat> For any given unit vector direction, I would like to know how fast is the function changing as I move in that direction. And said differently, once I've computed this directional derivative, this unit directional derivative, I would then subsequently like to know how, what u do I pick to make this as large as possible, or again, depending, uh, as small as possible. Okay. Well, we have all of our necessary tools at this point. Um, that directional derivative we have recently discovered can be computed with that dot product. Old news is that dot products are computed as magnitude times magnitude times cosine of the angle. Um, by assumption, that u is a unit vector, which means its magnitude is 1. So I can just scratch off magnitude of u. Furthermore, notice that in this picture, right, as I'm considering at this point A, as I'm considering different unit vectors, or different possible directions, I'm considering all of those different directions at the same point, right? Therefore, the gradient vector is the same. For all of these different unit vectors, I'm still going to be dotting with the same gradient. The gradient only depends on f. At this point A, the gradient's pointing that way, period. Doesn't matter which way I'm going. So, for the purposes of this consideration of different possible u's, the gradient is constant. And has magnitude that is positive. So what we have then is this object of interest is computed as a positive constant times cosine theta. So the question of how do we make this unit directional derivative as, as large as possible, 
right? What direction maximizes the rate of change of the function as you move in that direction? Well, what, what value of theta makes cosine theta as large as possible? And you just gotta think about your old trig facts, and the cosine's always between negative one and one, and maximum value is one, and it's at that maximum value when theta is equal to zero. Right? So, uh, this angle here, uh, looking at, uh, this angle, that angle theta, my best unit vector is when that angle theta is zero. Said differently, uh, my best unit vector, uh, whoops, is the unit vector uh, that points exactly in the direction of the gradient vector. Yeah? Can you explain one more time why you could treat the gradient as constant? Yeah, so, so uh, what we're doing, uh, we're, we're computing directional derivatives of this function f, right, and function is given. We're also currently at this point A, and we have not yet started to run. Right? So this point A is fixed. Now look at how we compute the gradient vector. The gradient says, take your function f, well that's given. Compute a bunch of partial derivatives, and then we're gonna plug in this point A, which is fixed. And again, we have not started to run yet. So we're not asking, okay, which direction should I, you know, as I, as I run through this minefield of mosquitoes, you know, what curve should I follow that makes optimal? That we're, that's, whoa, hard, much harder question. We're asking the simple question of at this fixed point, what's my best strategy, what's my best direction? And at that fixed point, this is, you can just compute it. It, it is what it is, right? And as you contemplate different U's, you're contemplating those different U's from that exact same point A, and so this is always the same. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Yeah, anybody else? Anybody else okay? All right. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. So neat. So neat fact. Then um, the gradient vector. There is something geometrically natural about that gradient vector. Now, this gradient vector is not just an algebraic thing. Let, let me emphasize: we derived it as an algebraic thing. The Jacobian matrix was an algebraic thing. This is an algebraic tool for um, for computing. This algebraically defined uh, derivative transformation. It's all straight up algebra, and then uh, the, the gradient was what you get when you take this and you know look at a uh, single row and turn it sideways. This is algebra. What we now have is a geometric interpretation of it. The gradient vector is a vector that points in the direction that you should run. It points in the direction that the function is increasing the fastest. This is what we call the direction of fastest increase. And it is, a, a again, a geometric observation to talk about it. Um, direction of fastest increase. Geometric, because it's a direction. And this is a natural geometric thing to talk about because making a function increase as fast as possible is routinely something we want to do. Right? Maybe we want to increase the efficiency of our engine as fast as possible, or we want to increase employment as quickly as possible, or you know, there's a million different things that we want to increase, and hey, let's do it now. Let's not waste time. Right? So crazy natural, intrinsically geometric. Okay. All righty. Um, now, a quick observation before I go on. Um, again, you know, people have this fascination with graphs. And, uh, you know, I guess, okay, sure. Uh, if we were drawing a graph, you know, so uh, z, is the, uh, z is equal to f of x, y. And we were drawing a graph um, of, uh, of this function of x and y. Then when we say we want to increase the value of the function as fast as possible, now notice here's my same scenario. I've got some point A in the domain, and I'm thinking about all the different directions in the domain that, that I could move to make some function increase. Um, increasing the value of the function means that you're increasing the height. 
because that's what graphs are. The value of the function is height. And if you are increasing um, the height as fast as possible, if you're on a surface and, and moving, on the map at least, moving in the direction that makes your altitude increase as fast as possible, we call that a hill. <laughs> right? So the gradient vector points in the domain, it points uh, in the direction that corresponds to uphill on the graph. Or sometimes they like to call this the direction of steepest ascent, uh, which I've uh, written down somewhere. Yeah, here it is. Direction of steepest ascent. Uh, it, this term, direction of steepest ascent, is just a graph context alternative for uh, direction of fastest increase. Um, you can um, use either one of these terms that you like. I like to say direction of fastest increase because that's intrinsic to the function. This is what it is. This phrase, direction of steepest ascent, only makes sense if you happen to actually be looking at a graph of the function, and very often you're not. So my person, I think this is a uh, highly inferior terminology, right? Um, but um, it, it is in fact more common. <laughs> You're going to hear more people say direction of steepest ascent. So my, my suggestion is that when you hear people say direction of steepest ascent, then in your own mind you think, oh, okay, they're stuck on graphs, fine. But they mean direction of fastest increase. Yeah. Yeah, well that's a great question. So if you are at a maximum point, then there is no uphill, right? In, in a graph context, there is no uphill. Um, and uh, if there's no uphill, then there is no direction in which it's increasing the fastest because it's not increasing at all. But here's another thing, it's also not decreasing. So appeal to your intuition about hills, right? If you're at the very top of the hill, it's flat up there. and um, uh, in fact, what would happen is the gradient vector would be the zero vector. Yeah. And so this relates to a, a topic called optimization, and that's uh, optimization something we are going to cover in this class, but it's going to be later, it's going to be quite a bit later. In the book, it's um, it's like uh, two sections forward, we're almost there. But in this class, we're going to skip it, uh, we're going to come back to it later for reasons that I'll explain uh, pretty soon. Uh, but yeah, totally. Great question. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, oh, uh, it is a great break time right now. So why don't we uh, call it for 10 minutes. Uh, see y'all at 1120.